<laughs> Hello, welcome to Call on the Midwife. I'm here for my day of sharing with you. I hope you're well today. It's overcast today here, but we had a beautiful evening last night with a bit of a uh, thunderstorm kind of that just came and went. It was so beautiful. And I made bread yesterday, so I'm going to show you some of my um, bread and how it turned out. Um, I've got a really good class, I think, today for us. I hope you're well. My right eye is kind of sleepy today, so I apologize for that. Welcome to Call on the Midwife. I'm Charlene Campbell, and I'm going to be talking about preeclampsia and our clinical practice guideline for preeclampsia at birth joy midwifery when I was practicing as a midwife in Seattle. And um, I'm going to also talk about holy anointing oil recipe that I got from my good friend Zoe when she came up and taught our herbal class here in Ashton, okay? And I'm going to um, give you the peri pad recipe today. Um, for making an herbal peri pad. And that recipe comes from Zoe also. I'm going to talk a little bit about a book that I used to recommend a lot to my families. And um, I'm just going to show it to you right now so you can see the picture of the cover. It's called Calms. It's just a little tiny book for parents to help them when they're just feeling a little bit, like they need a little bit more help with... Um, how to soothe their baby. And I'm going to go over the main points. The CALMS is an acronym for um, five different things that you can do that can help you. So I'm going to go over that with you today. Hope everybody's doing well. Thank you again for your support and um, for watching and caring. Uh, if you would like to make a donation of anything for our kits, um, please do. The list is back a couple videos in the description box if you of what we're collecting right now we're not collecting everything but there's a list there okay and then i'm gonna show you another book by carl jones i have another book by carl jones i'll show it to you after and i'm going to talk about one of the recommended visualizations that he recommends okay and then um i'm going to talk about sanitation now, this is coming from the handout, um, which is an herbal handout for first aid stations or places of refuge that people are trying to create. And I mean, this could be all different things. It could just be you and your home and your family having extra supplies so that you can help somebody. Or it could be like somebody like me who has the resources and like is really feeling called to do it where right now I'm actually looking at another property where we can be more off grid. Um, it's 29 acres up north of here. And um, I really want to have a place where moms can come and have a recovery center for moms who've had trauma from, um, it could be from so many things. It could just be from being evacuated or from going through a disaster or a war or it could be from being involved and being um, part of um, sexual abuse trade, which I have this knowledge by the spirit. I know this is true that the sexual, um, <clears throat> I've got my peace sign on today. <laughs> the sexual abuse, uh, well, the, the sex slave trade, whatever you want to call it, that's so rampant here in our country. Um, I believe that with things that are changing, with the um, exposures of everything, that there's going to be a fallout of that. And that's going to be a thing that's going to be needed as a place for these women to recover, you know, or men, whoever they are, who are ready and able to be rescued. OK, because usually they have to actually want to be rescued. They have to actually get themselves out. I mean, it can happen in multiple ways, but oftentimes they don't know they're being molested and used. They think they're part of it somehow. And that's part of the convincing of them by their um, captors that, you know, it's part of the brainwashing that keeps them there. Just like, um, I don't know if I'm sure most of you remember that Mormon girl that was 
kidnapped from her home in the night. I studied her life. I'm trying to remember her name now. But she was, you know, they had brainwashed her by the end, even though she came out of it and she's healed now. But it was, that's part of the tactic of people who, who use you sexually. Okay. And then, um, yeah, I've got a bunch of other cute little things that I'm going to share with you, but that's the main lineup for today. So welcome to Call on the Midwife. How's everybody doing today? I feel a little tired today, but I feel really solid in my commitment to do this. So thank you for showing up too and watching. Okay. I just feel like whatever God wants me to do is what I'm interested in right now. <laughs> That's it. I want to just show you something that's really neat. I've been gathering a lot of roses. I just want to show you how pretty they are when they're all dried up. You know, you just flatten them out. On, you don't have to flatten them, but you put them in a thin layer while they're drying, you know. And, and it's nice to take a few leaves, too, because they're good in the tea. Every part of the rose is it's the highest frequency of any plant. So it's really good for just about everything. And then once you're done, you just put it in a jar. I've showed you these before, but it's so easy. And um, then the other thing you can do is make tea out of roses. So easy. This is I love drinking tea out of fancy tea cups. And one of the things I just used that yesterday, okay, I'm going to tell you what you can use it for. Like, I think with what we're coming into, oh, an eagle just came by, a white bald-headed eagle. It's been coming. It came by yesterday. It's huge. That's very rare to have them right in my front yard. <laughs> well, anyway, oops, I got a few of these just that dropped down here. But what with what we're coming into, okay, which, I mean, it, I think it's going to be different everywhere, just different things happening all over the place, you know, and just a, a good idea to not be so dependent on stores and other people and doctors and all that stuff and pharmaceuticals and whatnot. Okay. So, well, anything to do with the reproductive system. So polyps or cysts or endometriosis or um, infertility, or just like absolutely anything um, pain on menstruation, all of these different um, parts of, you know, challenge for the reproductive system for moms, whether you're a teen or a, or an older mom or, a, you know, a perimenopausal woman or a full on menopausal woman like myself. Um, it's good for everything. Okay, this, this is which is the steams. And I've talked about them before, but they're so easy. They're so easy. So you take about like half a cup of this. Yesterday I did one. I took half a cup roses, half a cup. Um, well, maybe not a full, yeah, probably half a cup because they kind of bulk up, you know. So half a cup roses, half a cup of the um, the large, large um, peonies, pink peonies. And then I put um, prickly, le uh, prickly lettuce, which is an analgesic, and, a, and it also has other properties, many others, and um, some red clover, okay? And then I put them into a stainless steel bowl, bowl, stuck that into the toilet bowl, poured in. I use distilled water, but you could just use your tap water. It's best if it doesn't have chlorine in it. So you, if you have chlorine in your water, you just you, you uh, purify your water with either a Berkey or some kind of um, Berka or whatever you have. And you, um, you use that water, you boil it, you put it on there, you let it sit for about three to five minutes, not too long, because you want it to be steamy hot, but not burn you. Okay, and then you sit there with the towel around you with dim lights, and you could have a candle lit or some nice gentle, I like to play cello music or flute music or just any kind of music that makes me kind of relax and feel really, really good. And then I pray. I did that this time, what I taught you the other day, which I'm starting to practice every day, um, what Elaine Arnold, the midwife in Seattle, taught me, which is praying over the herbs 
as if they're the mud in the eyes that Jesus used, because we know that they can be magnified, they can be made into something more spiritual, okay? So I've been doing that, and it's really, I'm finding it extremely effective. Um, I can just start feeling my whole body tingling after I say the prayer, and I'm absorbing it through your mucosa. It You can absorb steam so well, and the roses are such a high frequency. There's such a high frequency of a plant from, from Mother Earth that they are just designed to heal your reproductive system. Okay, so we're going to light our candle. I kind of went off a little bit on the roses, but that's okay. I have a little surprise for you today with my candle. Um, one of my favorite things is beeswax, okay? <laughs> my friend Nikki has bees now, and they have a really neat thing on their Facebook page about them. I think bees are really neat. I, I think a lot more people are starting to realize the importance of bees and of keeping bees and of how much that's going to help us in the future. So I just want to light this candle for all those who are preparing for the people to come in the future who now or anytime actually, because what I'm finding is they're coming in all the time. Like I'm always getting people who need my help and I'll be able to serve them. And sometimes it'll come through someone else who says, hey, I know a person who might be able to help you with that. And I feel like Zion is already happening. In my life, it is for sure, with the people that I live with. And well, I live with David, who lives downstairs. And then, of course, my husband is away most of the time. I think you know that. But a lot of you might not know that he works in Seattle a lot. But he comes back and forth. And then um, James, who works out in the shop and lives in the tiny house on our land. Um, but I just want to say that I, I feel like Zion is already happening in my life and I hope it's happening for you. And if it's not, I think it's just going to grow and become more and more. So I just want to say, dear Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother and Jesus, we are so thankful that we can be here. We're so thankful for the honeybees, for the flowers, for Mother Earth, for the sky, and the beautiful stars, and the beautiful moon, and the beautiful sun. We're so grateful for the rivers, and the lakes, and the oceans, and seas, and all the plants that we can use to encourage healing and to enhance our lives. We're so grateful for all the food that thou dost bless us with, and help us to be more uh, self-reliant and independent from the government and from other organizations that feed us, <laughs> that we might be able to be independent as much as possible so that if a time of need comes, we will be able to help others and put away for a time of need to be prepared to assist and serve the children of God on the earth that may need our assistance, who may be suffering. And we call down a special blessing for anyone who's in bondage, especially the sex slave trade or any other kind of bondage where they're being abused, battered, or smeared, or, or brainwashed in any way, that they may be free, that the Holy Ghost will free them, and that the Spirit of God will bring them to rescue and bring them to safety, and a safe haven will come to them through the Lord Jesus Christ and his ministry on the earth. And we ask that we will be part of that and that we will be in tune with the Spirit enough to know our part and do it quietly with care and cautiousness so that we are careful not to overdo it uh, at the expense of other things, but that we will keep balance in our lives and be able to be at peace at, in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Wow. Okay, well, that was good. Now, I want to show you one other thing, okay? I talked to you a lot about um, the moxa sticks and using them in lieu of acupuncture or acupressure on different points of the body, okay? And this, I mentioned these. These are called the San Paulo sticks. I mentioned these. These can be really, really good. Um, just putting them on certain points, um, I find right here is a good point. If I'm feeling stressed, if I do little points around my head, like right on the neck, if you've got a lot of neck tension, 
as a care provider, as a mom, or as a you know somebody helping pregnant moms, I feel like there's a spiritual element to this. It's from South America. It's called São Paulo, Saint Paul. I don't understand why it's so amazing, but it just. I think it's the faith of the people in South America. They're amazing people. Very strong believers in Christ, and they pray and. They haven't lost God in their schools, but we've lost God in a lot of our places of institutionalized learning, which hopefully they'll go away. I think schools are not a safe place. I homeschooled for all of my children pretty much until they were very much older. And then maybe when they got older, they could go to, they could go to high school if they wanted to. But once I had them established in more just their own self and they weren't so affected by other people because I would let them design their own curriculums every year. Of course, they, they learned what they wanted to and they're all entrepreneurs now. I wanted to bring this fan in because, like I said before, a simple fan is a great addition to your kit. To be able to fan either yourself, you know, if you're really hot and you're in a birth and you're trying to stay cool, that might be just what gets you through. Or... You know, you want to do some smudging so you, you're able to move the smoke around like that. Or you're just fanning the mom during especially second stage when she's pushing. She might just love to have that fanning, okay? All right, I'm just going to put it here. I'm going to put it out in my little shell. Or I can just let it sit in there and burn like that if I want to, okay? And it really is a pretty smell too. Okay. We'll move along. I have a really neat scripture for you. I'm on Instagram. If anybody wants to go check me out, it's birthjoy1. And what I did was I put together some of my favorite pictures from Instagram in this book because I think personally that the grid will go down at some point in the internet and it will change into something else. I mean, I'm not saying we won't have the communication, but I just think it's going to change. And sometimes when there's transitions, things things like with COVID and that, you know, the, things change, like your social life changes, your ability to access the internet or even electricity could be different, okay? So I got this book made of some of my favorite pictures to remember them by. And there's a scripture here I want to show you. I don't know if you can actually read that backwards, but let me read it. For she said within herself, if I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that very hour. I think combining our faith with the use of the herbs is really powerful. And that's what I suggest people do. I want to show you another picture of a birth. I don't think I've shown this one. It's a nice color shot there. <laughs> Baby's tucked right in at her breast. Yeah, true for mama. Okay. Right. <laughs> Thanks for joining me today. How's everybody doing? I'm doing well. And it's time for me to sing my song. So I'm going to sing my song. We're at 18 minutes. And then we're going to talk about the peri pad recipe and the holy anointing oil. I think it's kind of cool. It comes from an old recipe, I think from the old temple uses that they, you know, in Jerusalem, they used to actually have, I don't know exactly where Zoe got this recipe, but we're going to talk about it. Okay. Now I'm going to sing, I felt like I should just sing an old hymn. And so I actually literally, I said, okay, God, just let me open to any page in here and find an old hymn that you want me to find. This is the book that I've I use quite frequently, I really recommend. It's called Rise Up Singing. 
And you can get numerous volumes of this book, actually. It's got all kinds. And it's got categories of every different style of music, every different kind of music. So it opened up to page 98, Will the Circle Be Unbroken, which is kind of interesting with everything that's happening with the Queen right now. And her people have been walking through the queue 24-7, ever since they set it up at Westminster Abbey or wherever it is. And so there's a lot of people who really are paying their respects to her. I think it was a three mile queue last time I looked. Hey, I'm gonna sing to you. You ready? I think I'm gonna take my shot and get off for this. I've been a little warm, but it's actually overcast and cool here. I don't, I mean, we don't have to have the heat on, but it's, you know, so it's kind of changeable. All right, here we are. Let's do this thing. Yes. You ready? <laughs> I hope you enjoy this. I think it's a good song. And then we're going to get into some good things. I'm going to talk about um, the vital signs of mothers, the fetus or the unborn baby, and the newborn, what are all the proper normal range of vital signs, okay? Because I've been showing you different things that you can take vitals with. <laughs> it's good to know what the range is, what the normal range is, okay? And we're also going to talk about preeclampsia protocol today. So stick with me today. Have a notepad and a pen, and uh, we'll have some fun. Okay. We're going to sing a song first. It helps me calm down. It really does. Like, I'm not not calm, but I always notice after I sing, there's just a gentleness that comes in. So here we are. Music is so healing. I love music. Sorry, my, my chair isn't very comfortable today. <laughs> kind of. All right, here we go. Dear Father and Mother, please bless me. That I will please thee and the people listening right now with this music, that it will be healing for their hearts, and that it will permeate the computer and the internet and bring peaceful healing to people who are listening. In Jesus' name. Amen. I was standing by my window on a cold and cloudy day when I saw that hers come rolling for to carry my mother away will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by, there's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. Lord, I told that undertaker undertaker please drive slow for this body you are hauling how i hate to see her go oh i fall behind her, try to hold up and be brave, but I could not hide my sorrow when they lay her in her grave. But will that serve be unbroken 
by and by, oh, by and by. There's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. That's a little hard to sing without my boys, <laughs> Ernie and Jack. Oh, their harmonies are just like, woo. We actually wrote a whole new uh, verses to that. It's about, yes, it's the answer to the question. It's, yes, my father and my mother. They're so, you know, it's kind of like, it, it kind of picks the tone up. And we used to sing that. We'd sing that part first really slow. And then we'd go into the other part, which is basically the answer from God that is, yes, the circle will not be unbroken. There is everlasting and eternal life. And it's really beautiful. Okay. Affirmations. I'm going to show you some affirmations. I like to look at these every day. Um, if you can actually read that, I'll read it to you also. How can I remember my many blessings in time of trial? Here's another one. So that we can get out of just, folk, whatever we focus on is going to grow and it's going to expand and it's going to be drawn to us. So if we're asking the right questions, we can really attract good things. <laughs> and we can also keep ourselves on track with what we need to be doing, okay? Whom am I to help? Whenever I ask that, it's like someone will call or something will happen and there's someone there that I get to serve with my special, unique gifts and talents, which I think everybody has special and unique gifts and talents. I know we all do. Okay, and here's another one that I like to ask. Another question. Please help me know thy will to my heavenly mother and father, my God family, the God family. And then... Another last one that I have is may thy will be done in all things. Okay, I'm going to give us a little bell chime. And da, 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 da. I think I'm going to give us one more affirmation. Those were more like questions. But this is, this, uh, this is a great book, one of my favorite books, Melanie Beattie, Letting Go, The Language of Letting Go. I don't know if anybody else has this book, but... I sure have used it a lot in my lifetime, and I've needed it a lot in my lifetime, especially in the last few years. Okay, today, God help me pay attention to my recovery issues. Help me know that before I can work on the finer points of my recovery, such as relationships, I must be free of addictive behaviors. Yes. I think addictive behaviors, we all have them. I'm working on releasing addictive behaviors. It's just whenever we go to anything before we go to God and our, our higher self to, for answers, if we're going to something else just to cover it up, the emotions, because they're so uncomfortable. And I think that requires daily habits of doing things like journaling or talking into a tape or some way of processing grief and trauma. Okay. And getting your emotions clear, not necessarily talking to another person, but that can also be good too. If that person has the capacity to hold the space for your entire gamut of emo emotion and feelings, and if they don't, that's not the best place because whenever there's this restriction on it, it can be really hard to heal because then you just stick them down more, repress them. Repressed emotion is the reason people have addiction. So, and not feeling loved and belonging and all that. I mean, they've done research on uh, war vets, okay? And my injury that I had was the equivalent of a fifth level war vet that I had to my brain, the emotional side of my brain when I hit it in 2012. So that was 10 years ago. And um, they did research on these post war vets that came back from you know, Vietnam or wherever they went to Iraq. And the ones that had addictions were the ones that didn't have strong relations of love and belonging in their social circles, period, <laughs> period. 
So yeah, there's a lot of new research that's come out recently that is addictions are basically just a symptom of a lack of true feeling of love. There's just been too much trauma, too much shame, too much heartache, and too much blame. <laughs> too much judgment for sure. Okay, I'm gonna do one more. God. This is, I love how she just talks straight to God. God, help me let go of my need to be afraid. Like sometimes we don't realize we could be addicted to negative emotions. I kind of realized I was um, what, and I didn't even know it. And I had to really do a lot of self-reflection to realize that fear was underlying a lot of stuff that I was feeling and I didn't know. And I had to release it. I had to just completely let it go and do radical acceptance. I have a big sign in my room. It says radical acceptance, okay? So we're going to say this. Um, Today, I will help uh, God help me let go of my need to be afraid. Replace it with the need to be at peace. That's what I'm going for. Help me listen to my healthy fears and relinquish the rest. Yeah, it's not that you don't have any fear ever, but you learn how to manage yourself in an, more of an equilibrium without going into those fears and kind of negative spirals okay that's the book language of letting go i really like that one now we're gonna do our preeclampsia okay this is just our this is from my birth joy midwifery clinical practice guidelines okay and it's just very short clinical practice guidelines shouldn't be long um, they're different than protocols because protocols could be quite long and detailed about what you do, but this is more about the management and how you take it very specific, very um, general in a way. But let's just see. The definition, it's, I have it, um, I have all of my clinical practice guidelines divided into three categories, okay? Definition, management, and then consult or referral. How uh, we would do that, okay? So I'm just going to start with this is for preeclampsia. If any of you don't know what preeclampsia is, if you're new or you don't know, uh, preeclampsia is what happens if a mother has untreated uh, eclampsia, or you know, if she can she can preeclampsia is before it becomes eclampsia. Eclampsia is basically the mother's in um, having full-on seizures okay now that can happen in labor if her blood pressure is really high and it's untreated okay now i think having a good routine in pregnancy of um knowing how many grams of protein you're getting good quality protein not that you overeat protein you should eat it with other foods like fruits vegetables not necessarily fruit with the protein but um have a balanced diet of vegetables protein and fruit, but not too sweet of fruit because it can act like sugar in the body. Okay. Um, but if you are getting the proper amount of protein, and I would always have moms do like a three day diet sheet so that we could go over it. And sometimes I'd have her do it again. If she was having symptoms like her blood pressure went, went up or she's spilling protein in her urine at her visit or other maybe lots of swelling plus those that could be combination of stuff okay but the high pressure high blood pressure are going into borderline high blood pressure which is 130 over 80 up to 140 over 90 that's called borderline we wouldn't transfer out until they were at 140 over 90 but um if they were in that borderline area, they would be doing things to try to mitigate that. And then one of the things would be we would make making sure that their nutrition was really excellent, good quality protein, um, and watching their grams of how many they're getting. You know, you should get at a serving, you should get about half your palm of protein. And then you should have multiple servings, not three meals a day, but like more like five meals a day when you're pregnant. Okay. Not big meals, just enough so that you're getting, you're keeping your, 
your protein, you're keeping your blood sugar balanced. Just basically, you're not having all these spiky things going on. Um, okay, so just keep to keep it steadier is really important. And that will help prevent preeclampsia. It really will. Some people don't think so, but I've seen it. I know. And we, even when it would start going up, if we could get the mom to get on a good, making sure she, if it's not too far along, you know, if it hasn't gone too far and she gets her diet back in order and she starts taking maybe some magnesium supplements and starts um, lowering her stress, she can really, it can be turned around. It can't. Okay, so but I just wanted to tell you about one other thing. This is kind of a little bit dirty, this bottle, but it's a spray bottle, okay? And in this spray bottle is vodka, like 80 proof vodka, mixed with a liquid, really high quality liquid magnesium, okay? About that much for the rest of the vodka. You shake it up and you spray that on your limbs and on your, you know, insides of your arms. You can spray it on the back of your neck. And it literally will help absorb the magnesium into your body. Now, you can also take oral magnesium. And I think it's good to take it in a powdered form that's made into a liquid so that it's absorbable. And you can take it at night. A magnesium supplement in pregnancy can really help you sleep. It can help reduce restless legs. And it can help just a lot of things keep your, your energy more calm when you're not having any kind of magnesium deficiency. Okay. So let's go through this. So the definition of preeclampsia is blood pressure of 140 over 90 or higher and proteinuria, that's spilling of protein, um, in a previous normotensive woman. So in other words, if you just had sort of a history of high blood pressure, but it wasn't related to preeclampsia, that could be different, okay? This is in a woman who's had normal blood pressure all along in her, her life and in her pregnancy, and then suddenly she'll spike up. And it's usually after the blood volume expansion because it's usually because the blood volume expansion, this is my opinion, okay? You might not find this anywhere else, but I've studied this in my own life. And, you, you know, I really have learned what happens when the woman's uh, blood volume does not expand to double at around 28 to 32 weeks in that if it hasn't expanded to double by 32 weeks that mom's at risk for preeclampsia period because there's not enough blood volume there's not enough placental perfusion her liver's not getting flushed and her kidneys aren't getting flushed enough like they need to yes you need the blood volume so that's really has a lot to do with lifestyle and nutrition and I, I'll go over that later about things you can do to ensure your blood volume does expand. And then also to help your blood volume expand. Now, how can you tell? How do you know? Well, there is a test that you can tell. If you took your uh, hematocrit and hemoglobin, ex, you know, when you're first pregnant in your first six to 12 weeks and you go in to see your midwife, um, or you know, it says my connection's unstable. Well, I hope it's okay. Please, God, make it better. In Jesus' name, amen. So what I'm saying, though, is um, that you can turn it around. And how do you know? Well, when you first take, when you first do your blood work in the early part of pregnancy, in the first part of pregnancy, you can see your hematocrit, your ferritin, and your hemoglobin. Those are levels that help you be able to determine what your iron storage and current flowing hemoglobin is in your blood system, okay? And if your hemoglobin, say it was 13, say your hemoglobin was 13, and then when you take every pregnant mom, we would always test her around 28 weeks, okay, to see how is her iron and what has happened. And almost invariably, with the moms that were really healthy, we would see this two points drop in their hemoglobin. So if it was 14, it would be 12. If it was 15, it would be 13. If it was 13, it might even be 10. And we might have to give her iron supplements to help her bring up her iron because her blood became so diluted that uh, now she's kind of anemic because 
she didn't have a very high blood volume or iron storage to start with. But anyway, just to give you a little idea of how you can tell is when it's, um, you will see the reduction in the hemoglobin at 28 weeks, okay? All right, so the management, management of elevated blood pressure in the antepartum period may include, may include. So like I said, with practice guidelines, they're usually quite general, okay? Uh, so you would use your own diagnostic um, discernment and not even diagnostic. You're basically just, um, in a way it is diagnostic, but you're going to refer it out if it becomes out of normal range. So you're not actually going to be the one that keeps a person if they have true pre preeclampsia, if you're a midwife, because we don't work with people that are in high range or in high risk. And that is a high risk issue. Okay. It becomes a high risk issue if it goes to this level. But these are things that we do to check, you know, to make sure. So we would do a blood specimen for a preeclamptic panel. Now, a preeclamptic panel is like a metabolic panel for those of you who understand labs. And I always suggest and recommend, and we did this always, and I, I've consulted with obstetricians over this in Seattle, so I learned a lot from, as well as just studying on my own. But there's two sides to it. You know, the medical side is definitely a valid side. These women need help if they are this way, okay? But what this OB taught me, this female OB from Seattle taught me, was that you always need a baseline for your metabolic panel because she could be, she could have some things that look normal uh, or that, that are kind of out of normal range a little bit, but for her, they're normal, kind of like the blood pressure thing, okay? So always in those initial visit, in that initial visit, you should be doing a preeclamptic panel just to see what her metabolic uh, baseline is, okay? And then you've got something to compare it to, especially if you're consulting with an OB, they are going to be happy to see both, okay? And then a 24-hour urine sample, and you can get these big jugs. You send the mom home with the big jug. She pees in it constantly for 24 hours. She doesn't pee. No pee goes anywhere but in this jug, okay? And then she brings it into the lab, and they check that for protein. That's the best way to check for protein, okay? You, you know, when she comes in every week, we often would do a test strip so we could see if she had trace plus one plus two or plus three protein but really to do a proper that could come from other things okay it could be a uti or something right so we always want to do the 24-hour urinalysis for protein which is more definitive okay then random protein to create cre sorry creatinine ratio in lab work yes that's another test that we'd want to do. A non-stress test and biophysical profiles to make sure baby's good. So a non-stress test, I had my own machine, but we would also send them in for alternative uh, visits, and then we would do the alternative one in our machine. Basically just testing the baby to see if the baby is in a normal, responsive way, that if the baby is stimulated with the contraction or with any kind of movement, the baby's heart rate goes up and then comes back to normal again, to baseline, okay? And biophysical profile, you would send them into a, uh, probably be a, a group that does, uh, that has neonatologists on staff to do that. So they can read it properly. And then an AFI to observe possible oliguria. Now that's when the water is really low and there's not enough water and that can help also. I mean, that can happen with moms, okay? Now an AFI is, is to estimate how much of the fluid is still in there and what's the fluid index, okay? Amniotic fluid index is what it stands for. And then monitor growth of fetus for possible IUGR, interuterine growth retardation, yes. And that can happen if you don't have full placental perfusion, if your blood volume's not expanded, 
And if you have some kind of like nutritional issue or you have an autoimmune condition that makes it hard for you to eat, get enough nutrients or whatever it is, that can be a problem, okay? So monitoring to make sure baby's actually growing each week is really important. And we would usually consult with another person and work collabor collaboratively with the um, neonatologists until things got settled out. And, that, and if they did go out of normal range, then we transfer out of care. Um, monitor rapid weight gain. This can be another symptom that can happen simultaneously to these other symptoms. I've seen this where she comes in and suddenly she just gained 15 pounds in one week. And her, high, her blood pressure is going up to um, out of normal range. Or it could be within like that parameter of uh, 130 over 80 to 140 over 90. She's just borderline abnormal. Okay. So you want to take note of that. Um, or sudden edema on upper extremities, face, and head. So, you know, a lot of women get edema in their feet, swelling in their feet. That's actually pretty normal to have feet swelling in pregnancy, especially late pregnancy. It's not necessarily a sign something's wrong. But if your hands and your face are swollen and you go to bed and you wake up and they're still swollen, that's a problem. That could be. It could be. Not necessarily, but it could be. Something to talk to your care provider about. Having your client reduce activity and have modified bed rest in left lateral position is helpful. Freak, or I didn't say, I didn't have that on here, is helpful. We just put um, in left lateral position. I'm just saying it can be helpful. <laughs> Frequent self-monitoring of blood pressure during the week. So not just one time that they get their blood pressure. And they're writing it down and they're reporting their blood pressure to you. Uh, increase protein in diet. Yes, up to between 70 to 100 grams. Now, there's some debate on this, okay? Um, I personally think if it's high quality organic protein and you're not over consuming it, but you're doing it in moderation, and it's a variety of different types of protein, could be uh, meat, could be dairy, could be um, seeds and nuts, there is some controversy around seeds. I still eat seeds, but some people say they're not as easier to as easy to digest as nuts and the dairy and protein. Okay, uh, depending, of course, if you if you can't digest dairy, that's okay. You don't need dairy in pregnancy, but it's good if you have some other proteins like eggs or meat or um, nuts. Okay, all right. And you can get protein from vegetables too, like avocados and stuff, but that's more of a minor amount. Um, nut butters, um, smoothies that are made out of um, protein that is good quality protein. Um, I think goat whey can be really good, especially if it's from New Zealand and it's organic. Goat whey can be really good to add. Actually, goat whey can uh, not only prevent preeclampsia, but can uh, reduce it and get it to go away. If you know uh, how, if you're taking goat whey, I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen multiple with multiple women that took goat whey. Okay. I store goat whey powder just because I think it's good to have on hand. Okay. So, Reduce stress. You still need to have activity so your body, your circulation, you know, like exercise, walking, that kind of thing. You can't just lay in your bed all the time like they used to do, okay? That causes everything to kind of just get stagnant. You've got to keep the circulation going, okay? And then reduce stress and optimize nutrition. Calcium magnesium supplement of two grams of calcium per day. Make sure it's balanced properly with magnesium in the proper ratio. And then uh, what are the warning signs? This is probably the most important thing I'm going to tell you today. <laughs> I, think, I think knowing what a warning sign is for you as a mom 
if you're in your childbearing cycle or for anybody else that you're working with or anything is it's critical to know these okay now what are the warning signs that a person is either moving into preeclampsia or has full-on preeclampsia um epi gastric pain okay i'm going to stand up for a second okay epigastric pain usually under the right rib cage okay usually right here is where you're going to get it right by the liver but it could be up here too by the pancreas but not usually it's almost always going to be upper right gastric pain okay and then severe headaches that don't go away Severe headaches is a really big one. And then visual disturbances. Well, what, what are some of the visual disturbances that you'd have? Well, spots flying in front of your eyes, seeing spots flying in front of your eyes, floaters, any kind of that sort of stuff can be a sign if it goes along with the severe headache, ep epigastric pain. And then you've got uh, the blood pressure rising as well. That's a combination there. And then you add in swelling of the upper body. Yeah, those are all signs. Then expected management until term. So we would monitor her, but as long as she didn't go outside of normal range. And these symptoms, we would actually refer her to an obstetrician oftentimes if they didn't go away. Okay. Induction at term if cervix is favorable. Yeah. Frequent labs. Now, an induction at term, what does that mean? Well, for a home birth practice like us, it would mean um, usually some herbs. It could it could involve the the little um, low dose casserole cocktail, maybe some stretch and sweets or something. But we would always get Mama going if we needed to. Frequent labs for detection of worsening preeclampsia or developing HELP H E L L P syndrome which is a much more serious, well, it can be life and death. So can eclampsia, full eclampsia can too, if it's untreated. So yeah, those are not something to fool around with, eclampsia or HELP syndrome, okay? And that has to do with platelet imbalance. I'm not going to go into it, but now the last one for your we're almost done. Thanks for sticking it out, guys. It says we have an unstable condition, but, or, uh, connection right now but it seems to be still going so praise the lord um consult referral if severe as defined by blood pressure 160 systolic and one and or 110 diastolic okay that's what we have on ours I thought it was 90. I think we would always do 90. But I guess that's a real, that's in our definition. It has to be 160 over 110. It doesn't have to be, but that's kind of the, we can't go over that. We have to transfer in for a consult at least or a referral. <laughs> Usually we just refer out if it goes up that high. And significant proteinuria of five grams or more in a 24 hour collection consultation with the physician and transfer out of care. Yeah, that would be a transfer out of care for sure. Okay. Yay. <laughs> Got through that. <laughs> Praise God. Now I'm going to go through, before I do that, I'm going to show you guys a couple pictures. This is, I think I've shown this before, but it's one of my favorite ones in uh, Mexico. This sweet little lady was actually from India, but she lived in Jamaica. Sorry, Mexico. I met Jamaica. <laughs> I lived in Mexico and Jamaica. But I'm going to take a little drink. How's everyone doing? I wanted to show you a couple of things I think are good to collect. Just This is just going to take a minute. Well, one is dandelion and nettle tincture. I think this is a really good tincture to have if you want to help moms or yourself because it can be good for um, helping with like, say that woman had that upper right gastric pain, but you couldn't send her to an OB. Say you're in an out of hospital setting in a low resource setting and you're in a big, 
building with a bunch of people and you're working with people and it's just a daily thing and you're helping people and there's no one to send them to. Well, if you give a mom who's having liver, one of the big things with preeclampsia is the liver gets overloaded. It's really the filter systems of the body that get stressed and that's what creates it a lot. Um, and so dandelion is such a great tonic for the liver. So is nettle and it's safe to take in pregnancy. Um, I think a fresh tea out of this is great in pregnancy. And then this can be used postpartum if mom's had a bleed or she's had a low hemoglobin and she needs to build up her iron and her liver needs some support. Another thing that I thought is really good to have is the, is the um, essential oil eucalyptus. I use it in my bath with Epsom salts. When I'm really feeling a lot of stress or anxiety or, or else physical pain, I'll just put like 10 or 15 drops in there with a couple cups of um, Epsom salts and do a really good soak. It seems to help with emotional issues and with all kinds of stuff. And I think it's good for, it's good for infections. It's good for viruses. It's good for a lot of stuff. The other one, I mentioned this before, but I really think tea tree, oil, tea tree oil is a good addition to your kit used for, it's really good for diaper rash. You only need one or two drops in some a bowl of water and you can wash the baby's bottom. If the baby has fungus, which um, are thrush. Now tea tree oil will work on thrush too. Okay. So you can rinse the nipples and the um, baby's bum with very diluted tea trail and then let it dry and have some sun or light from a window and that can help heal the thrush okay all right let's have a couple pictures <laughs> how's everyone doing <laughs> i can't believe we're still here the whole time it's been saying that the internet is unstable but it seems like we're here if you want to say something go ahead if you're here um i just have a few pictures i want to show <laughs> and you can you can pause them if you want to get screenshots for the uh, information. It's my little grandson. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll keep going. Here we are. Well, we did preeclampsia number eight. Holy anointing oil. Actually, before I do the oil, I'm going to go in here and do the, because we just talked about blood pressure. I want to keep it together. This is from page 21 in uh, my manual, okay? This manual. Most of you know about it. You can get it at midwifery today. But just want to give you the normal parameters for the newborn, the unborn and the mother okay so here they are maternal vitals blood pressure between 90 over 60 and 130 over 80 that's normal okay now sometimes moms can go a bit lower than that but it isn't really normal it's not normal for a mom to have blood pressure 80 over 50 if she does there's usually something going on she's she's overdoing it or something's going on with her that we need to look at uh, pulse is 70 to 100. Okay, that's the just the regular pulse. And then temperature is less than 38 degrees Celsius. Her normal temperature should be 98.6 Fahrenheit with a range of normal going from 97.0 to 99.0. So remember, sometimes mom can seem like she has a low-grade fever in labor. But that's just because of labor. Labor can make her temperature go up to 99. But if it goes up to 100 or 101, that's a, fe that's, that's a fever. That's a, a growing fever. So if, you know, sometimes that can just be because she's too hot or she's been in the tub. Get her out, hydrate her, uh, cool her off, and retake her temperature. Should be 99 or between 97 to 99. Then the fetus or the unborn baby, I like to call the baby an unborn baby. Oh dear, I have something on my tooth. Sorry. <laughs> Lipstick. 
<laughs> Nothing like being very humbled. I'm humbled. I don't care. I love working for the Lord. It's good for me. Okay. <laughs> I feel his spirit too. <laughs> uh, okay. The fetus or the unborn baby should be 110 to 160. Now that's interesting because when a baby's sleeping, they'll usually be 110. Okay. Um, now with this, a friend of mine who just went to her, her, oh, well, she went to this OB and he told her the baby's heart rate's 110. That's not normal. And it actually is normal. So it's kind of interesting. And then the temperature of the newborn baby is, uh, 36.5 to 37.5 Celsius or 97.0 to 99.0 Fahrenheit under the arm is the best place to take a baby's temperature. You don't need to take it in the bum or the mouth. That can be really not so good. Just right under the arm and then you hold the arm down and hold it down so it can't move around. Get a good temperature that way. The newborn's heart rate should be 110 over 160, just like the unborn baby. Same thing. And the respiratory rate should be 30 to 60 breaths per minute. Okay. And just remember that babies breathe erratically. So they might, they don't breathe like we do, steady. You know, that steady breathing. They breathe. Um, They can have five to eight second intervals and pauses with no respiratory effort during those times. And it's still within normal range. They often will breathe really rapidly and then take deep breaths and then pauses. So just be aware of that. Don't be afraid to, and always listen for a full minute, never count for six seconds and then double it or, or you know, and then times it by 10, like you do with the mums. Uh, or the fetal heart rate during uh, um, labor, sometimes you might do that. But when the newborn is born, you should count for a full minute always when you're counting respirations, heart rate, or any of that. That's my opinion on it. Okay, we're going to do the um, couple of those recipes. I wanted to show you, this is my little, uh, these dried in like one week. This is the juniper and sage stick i'm just gonna light it and see but it, it seems like it's gonna be really good i'm just gonna show you okay now this might be a little bit sparky and stuff So yeah, so these can be used. Mm, that's beautiful. Mm, that's that's really nice. So that these can be used, like I said, for many things, but especially for either purifying the air of uh, bacteria and spiritual debris too. <laughs> and it can also be used for um, doing the the pressure points or the acupuncture points with heat instead. Here's a beautiful card that my mother sent me. I love uh, Madonnas. I like to collect them. This is another one that my, um, my friend, my neighbor sent me this this week. I got it in the mail. It's kind of different picture of Jesus. Eh? She keeps me stocked with her eggs and her zucchini and I like to give her my bread and my soup so we have a kind of synergistic <laughs> neighborly connection me and Penny okay well I want to just um review this is the list of drug guidelines for the midwives in Seattle area where I was and part of that was the mag sulfate so that if we had a issue with this during labor we still carried what we needed to in our kits if suddenly in labor things shot up we would always call uh emergency medical services but in the meantime this is what we had magnesium sulfate 
Severe hypertension, threatened maternal seizure, always transport with administration. So we would never just send them in. We would always have this already in place so that they're already getting treatment. And we would take magnesium sulfate, five grams diluted in, um, in dextrose 5W admin I am well how we would usually do it is in the buttocks okay now this says you could put it in a um, an IV I think we would do that too we would put it in the IV so we'd have five milligrams running in the IV and then we would put half of the five in each buttocks so two and a half grams in each buttocks of the mother okay that was our protocol Let's see there Okay, what's on our list now? Well, we want to get this. I'm going to give you this holy anointing oil recipe that my beloved Zoe gave me. She's got Exodus 30, 22, 25. Um, it's, yeah, this was consecrated and it was used in the olden days. Okay, two ounces of myrrh. It's a resin, it's a very thick oil. Two ounces of cassia, it's basically cinnamon. So you have, um, you use the essential oil cinnamon, which is also an anti-hemorrhage. I find that kind of interesting that cinnamon is an anti-hemorrhage. Um, and then one ounce of cinnamon bark, one ounce of common sweet flag, I'm not familiar with that, and four ounces of olive oil. And then she adds some vitamin E oil, just a few drops to extend the life of the oil. So you just add all those together. Okay. I've made similar oils to that. I have. I use a lot of oils. I love oils. Okie dokie. I want to talk a little bit about this book, okay? A lot of my parents were either, well, some of them were first-time parents. But some of them just wanted to change the way they they parented their babies and wanted to be more in tune. And so I think this is really good. C, check in with yourself and assess your feelings. Isn't that interesting that that's the first thing? So your baby's crying. Say your baby's crying and you've already changed the baby. You've already tried to feed the baby and you don't know what to do. Baby's just crying. So you check in with yourself because this can help prevent um, postpartum depression and all kinds of anxiety and different things too. So you check in with yourself and you assess your feelings. Being emotionally intelligent, emotionally regulated can really help you make better decisions. It can help you be a better parent and it can help you not get um, mental illness. So check in with yourself and assess your feelings. Number A, allow a breath. I've been teaching you guys this a lot. Relax your body. Let's do it. Nice deep breath. And you breathe in through the nose. Sometimes I do a shh, be very calming. Shh, and you can also do it toward the candle using that as your focal point. You can spell your breath like I talked about in the last video. Listen to your baby is number three, okay? So you've checked in with your feelings. You've acknowledged yourself, how you're doing. Um, you're honest with yourself about how you're doing. You allow a breath, you relax your body, and right there you're going to be better. You're going to do better at responding to your baby. You listen to your baby and you be aware. So listen to your baby. What does it sound like your baby's trying to tell you? Okay. Maybe your maybe your baby wants you to lay your baby down and you know take your baby's legs and do some exercises like this because sometimes they can get like congestion in their stomach with. Uh, digestion and their bowels need to just move their bowels sometimes have a hard time moving okay so massaging their legs and pushing their legs in and out taking oil and really giving your baby a good olive oil massage i think it's really good i studied ayurvedic and indian newborn massage and i did that with my last 
with actually all my babies. And Jordan, I did it a lot with my son that was in, he was born by cesarean section and I felt like he needed more stimulation. And I did it in front of a beautiful fire. He was born in the fall. So I'd have a beautiful fire. I'd have a, a sheep rug. I'd have this beautiful um, music that imitated the mother's heartbeat. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of it now. It actually had the mother's heartbeat on top of the music because it's so much the same. It's handle water and animal music, I think. And um, and then I would do the massaging. And you can go online to learn about um, infant massage. It's really great. I think it's good for babies and mamas. Okay, now we're at number M. We've done C A L. Now we're at M. Mirror and reflect your baby's feelings oh you oh you know you, you talk to them you, you you know I do that with my cat and she stops meowing <laughs> we all need to be mirrored to be validated to be just loved and nurtured that way so mirror and reflect your baby's feelings and then s soothe your baby and they have all different things in here there's well I think there's the five s's of soothing swaddling, swaying, sucking. I don't remember them all, but there's five S's of, soothe, of soothing a baby. So <laughs> anyway, okay, I think we've touched on that a little bit. Now the peri pad recipe, okay? Before I show you that, I'm gonna show you some more pictures, just a few, just for fun. This is about pushing and the paws. We talked about that last time quite a bit. I don't know if you can see these pictures very good. The black and white. Okay. This is me in Mexico. The baby outside of an adobe hut. The body was made to move. Movement creates wellness. Keep a lighthearted, encouraging attitude. I think for pregnancy and birth. And with anything that's happening, we create our own bubble of goodness and light. So don't let in anything dark. <laughs> I mean, anything that we start fearing or letting grow in our minds can take over and become a point of stress. So I think really having a super, super positive attitude that's realistic as well, you know, is really good. And being able to mirror and reflect back mom's feelings if she's not feeling well too. And this is one of my favorite midwives from many years ago from Canada. She, she taught me how important the use of the Pinard was. Callia Leslie, I love her from Kelowna. It's another gal who had an amazing team. Her doula was right behind her, supporting her. Incredible support. Okay. How's everybody doing? <laughs> it's been a long one. 113. Hey, that's a pay attention number for me. <laughs> Great. Welcome and stick it out. We're almost done. Okay. Next is the peri pad recipe, but where did it go? Sorry, I had it here and it's disappeared. Sorry about that. <laughs> I guess we're not doing it. <laughs> we're kind of running late anyways. I'll bring it in next time. Basically, I can tell you the recipe. You take a handful of powdered comfrey, put it in a bowl with about half a cup of honey and about half a cup of wheat germ oil or olive oil, and you just stir it up, make a paste out of it, and then you can put a couple drops of calendula tincture in there. 
keep stirring it and make a nice paste. And then you put it on her pads, and if she wants them frozen, you fold them together, put them in a, uh, a Ziploc bag, and put them in the freezer. And then when you take them out, they're kind of rounded so that they don't freeze straight. They need to freeze so they fit her. And then that salve, that comfrey salve paste with the um, organic honey is ready to go on her perineum she needs it okay that's the peri pad that's my recipe i think hers was a bit different but anyways it's, i don't know where it is anymore we're going to do a guided visualization and then we're going to do some some stuff from the sanitation information on the uh first aid station and uh, i'm actually going to take a little bit my Celery juice, David made. Cheers, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for joining me. I'm calling the midwife. Here I am again. I'll show you one other picture from my one of my another one of my favorite midwives, Carol Gucci from Squim. You just we have some really really special people in our midst. And at one point in time, that would have been really a, uh, a big, uh, she would have been one of the most prominently respected members of our society at one point when midwives were really honored and valued in this world. I think that was a long time ago when people believed in Heavenly Mother. <laughs> Somehow she got written out of the Bible. I don't know how that happened, but. I'm sure she'll be back <laughs> one day. Alrighty. So we're going to do our guided visualization. Here it is. You ready? We're almost done. This is another book, okay? Another book of Carl Jones called Visualizations for an Easier Childbirth. Another one of my favorite books. <laughs> now, he's talking about cesarean prevention. And um, he says he thinks that uh, affirmations really help moms to not have cesareans. And these are some of the affirmations that he thinks are good for cesarean prevention. Okay. Childbirth is a normal process. So why don't we go ahead and take ourselves into a little bit of a, a nice relaxed state, nice deep breathing. And we can do uh, deep chest uh, diaphragmic breathing in our lower right here diaphragm. You can hold right there and push your push your hand out. Childbirth is a normal process. Childbirth is safe. I am able to birth naturally. I open for my baby. My uterus is dependable and strong. I am strong. I am safe. And then you can close your eyes. And if you're pregnant or if you're in childbearing year or if you've had a baby in the past, you can just see yourself welcoming your baby after having this nice natural vaginal birth and you just, you're holding your baby and you just feel your baby, you kiss your baby, you can smell your baby, you feel the wetness of your baby on your skin. You just imagine your baby healthy and strong, vigorous, pink. And you're smiling. You imagine yourself, oh, I'm so happy. I had such a wonderful birth. And I'm holding my sweet little baby. Doing that for about five to ten minutes every day, a couple times a day, really, really increase your chances of having a better birth. 
is you're, you're, you're basically putting it into your subconscious mind. It's, it's highly, highly um, helpful. And he even says this is what he noticed, and this is back in the 80s, okay? So, yes, let's just take another deep breath. I'm going to say a couple more affirmations. I don't know where this card came from, but I found it yesterday. Somebody gave it to me. I am reliable. I am sincere. I am motivated. I am in tune. I am well prepared. I receive positive solutions. I flow with love and light. I am open and emotionally receptive. I am adaptable and flow with life. Okay, this is nice one for us. All right, now we've done that. The last thing that I have here, oh, I have two things left for us. How are we all doing? <laughs> We're almost at an hour and a half. Yay, that's kind of what they've been. So I'm glad it's easier for people maybe to plan to get them done and watch them. Okay, this is going to be me going through some of the details from this handout that I've worked on before. It's an herbalist view of setting up a first aid station, okay? And the, what we're going to work on is basic sanitation rules. Some of you may know these. I still think it's a good thing to review, okay? Here we go. You ready? Number one, use disposable gloves whenever touching an open wound and make sure to use new ones for each new person. Keep a few pairs on you at all times. Now, if you've run out of gloves, what they, uh, my friend uh, who works at the birthing center in Rigby, uh, Sila Birthing Center, it's a really nice group of people that run that center. And Kathy LeBaron is the midwife there. She's lovely. She's from Mexico originally. And she said that in Mexico, one of the things that they were quite low on resources, gloves was one of them. And she remembers they would have just a big bucket full of bleach water, or um, I think they used um, pine salt, like something that has actual antibacterial qualities. And then you rinse your gloves and dip them in that, and they would use kitchen gloves so they were thicker. Okay. It's an option because disposable items, of course, can be come obsolete actually in these situations okay but if you have them keep them with you all the time and change them out between people or if you're using okay using disposable gloves when touching any person's fluids including blood pus or saliva yes always do that but if you're using um, kitchen gloves that can be those can be rewashed okay if as long as there's no holes in them Number three, wash your hands regularly between each patient if any touching was involved, and especially after touching open wounds, handling anything such as foot basins that can become contaminated or have having used the latrine, but really just wash your hands very regularly. We ran out of water here recently for two days. It was really serious. <laughs> I had enough water, but... What I realized was that I couldn't wash my hands as much as I wanted to. And I realized I washed my hands constantly. And so, yeah, having stuff to be able to wash your hands and keep your hands clean, it's really important. I think storing things like vinegar, white vinegar and bleach and pine salt, stuff like that is good. Uh, use soap each time. Use providone iodine. Iodine. Some mums are allergic to iodine, actually. So we stopped using betadine. If you have clearly touched something, frankly, or seemingly infectious, you can use that on your hands if you're not allergic to it. Okay. Number six, learn the signs and symptoms of infection, such as pus, 
slow healing wounds and the look of staff. Look, what does a staff wound look like? I, when I lived in Mexico, I used to go around the village and I would do well woman care and infant care and child care too. I would administer to the children and many of them had staph infections in their feet. That was a big thing in Mexico that I saw in the villages. Okay, because a lot of them didn't wear shoes very much. And there was fecal matter. Just, I mean, there wasn't, a, the animals were kind of all mixed in where I was in Peñitas, which is in a tiny little village just north of Mexico City. Pretty poor and low resource communities there. Okay, so learn about common infection agents such as water and foodborne pathogens pathogens, including Giardia, uh, Shigella, E. coli, and Salmonella. Yes, these can be in our environment, so we have to really watch for that. I think having a lot of white vinegar, a lot of bleach to clean things with. Okay. Um, learn er the early symptoms of the above. This can do a lot to help prevent the spread of infection. Yes, kind of catching infections before they get worse, okay? And then also isolating people that have them so they're not giving those infections to other people. Number nine, develop and maintain a serviceable hand washing station. Yes, my property where I'm looking at, I want to put on a, um, a washing station, like a big washing station where you could go in, wash clothes, wash hands. Um, number 10, have a washing area for bowls, cups, and utensils. Number 11, educate about not sharing things that have touched mouths, such as water bottles, bowls, and utensils. Yes. Teach, number 12, teach others how to take care of themselves and their community. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> I think knowing ahead of time how you're going to respond and not being afraid is really good. And also knowing what your niche is, like what's your responsibility that takes prayer and supplication and time with God individually to find out what they have for you as your mission and calling in this winding up days as we wait for Jesus to come. Yay. I'm excited about him coming. I, I want to read something just as, just as a little brief interlude. Okay, this is a really cool book. It's called Science Hope. This lady, her name is Georgia Lafouris. And her, one of her quotes, she lived from 1868 to 1950. One of her quotes is, scream, push. You've got a baby in there, not a pea in a pod. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh, I'm just going to read a tiny bit about how she became a midwife, okay? Georgia was born in a remote village of Greece in the late 1860s. Little is known regarding her early history other than she frequently took food to her brothers and father as they watched their flocks grazing in the hills. On one such occasion, a woman called to her asking for assistance as she labored in the open fields, unable to reach home. This is an unassisted birth where she needed help. With the simple direction of the mother, Georgia was able to safely deliver the baby, beginning a long and successful career in medicine. She was only 14 at the time. I find it very encouraging and uplifting to read about people like that. If you want to order um, some of the vaginal, or she calls them yoni steams, um, from Caitlin Han Hancock, this is her... Um, her information. I don't know if her, yeah, I think her website's on here somewhere. And this, these are the benefits of all the herbs and the herbs that she puts in hers. Okay. I'll keep going on our list. That was just a little interlude. <laughs> okay. Number 13. Dispose of all infectious medical waste properly. This is a diagram here. There's a little diagram here. Okay, let's see what it says. Simple foot operated hand wash station with bucket, tubing, and siphon bulb, which is the part 
pumped with the foot to move water through the tube. So a way you can make a little hand washing, rig up a little hand washing station in a low resource area. And that's it. That's the list. Okay. Yay. I think we did everything. We're going to be right at 1.30. So how's everybody doing? That was fun. I enjoyed it. Do a couple more affirmations before we say goodbye. I am choosing, choosing, I am choosing to awaken and grow. I am worthy. I merit love. I am deserving. I value myself. I am divinely aware and discerning. I am jubilant. Life is a joy to me. I'm going to leave it there. I am jubilant. Life is a joy. Well, bless everyone. I hope you enjoyed your class today. And um, feel free to say something once in a while if you want to. I'd love to know who you are. <laughs> I think who you are is people who want to learn this either for yourself or for others. and um, Or you could be student midwives too. Whoever you are, thanks again. And bless your day. And may you feel the love of God all over yourself and your life. And in every problem you have, may it be dissipated by just your own attitude of loving peace and radical acceptance. And so everything just becomes a joy. All right. May you feel his love today and tomorrow and every day. I'll see you next week. <laughs> Take care. Bye, everybody. Have a good one.